Good evening and welcome to the BS and Beer Show. Of course, BS stands for Building Science. Our topic tonight is Foundation Systems. Uh, I'm Travis Brunyard. I'm in Prairie Village, Kansas. Tonight, I am drinking a Free State Guava Toss Sour, as I am wont to do, uh, from my Stego koozie. And uh, I would like to remind you all that BS and Beer is an independent grassroots movement to share building science knowledge through local meetup groups and this, our Zoom show. Uh, the brew crew and our guests volunteer our time each month to bring you what we hope is a fun and informative discussion. If you are interested in starting your own group, we would encourage that. Uh, you can find advice on how to start your own group at the bsandbeershow.com or ask one of us. Um, I would like to just take a quick second to thank our media partners, Green Building Advisor, and also Fine Home Building Magazine. And with that, I'll introduce my friend and partner, Emily. Hey guys, Emily Mott from Architect here in Maine. Tonight we're having a wicked hazy in the uh, retro tech koozie, but if the night goes well, we'll follow that up with wicked easy. So uh, yeah, that's a goal for the night. Um, chat box. So for any of you here who are new on Zoom, which probably is absolutely no one at this point in your life, uh, make sure that you pick everyone or all hosts and all attendees when you respond in the chat box so people know you're here. Say hi so your friends know you're here. Only the panelists on the screen can see who is in the audience. So say hi, introduce yourself, tell us what you're drinking. Um, Find Home Building sends out a Zoom reminder when we have a show. All that does is remind you to join us live on the show. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, pop over to the bsandbeershow.com and join the mailing list so you'll get uh, an introduction to who the guests are going to be and what we're going to talk about. And go over to the blog on Green Building Advisor where we'll tell you what the next show is going to be and you can continue the conversation from tonight's show. The video recording is up on the YouTube channel, usually by the weekend, uh, so you can catch old shows if you've missed past shows, and also will be up through the link on Green Building Advisors podcast. An audio-only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts if you're interested in that. A um, couple of quick announcements uh, that Mike will copy into the chat box. The Sweet 16 wall contest, a lot of great subscriptions this year. Tune in on Tuesday. Um, we're going to do a uh, conversation with some of the guests on the wall competition. So make sure you guys join us for that, hosted by Casey BS and Beer. Um, the Pretty Good House book is almost out almost ready. We're getting pretty close to release date where paper physically printed out. Um, if you missed it, Find Home Building posted a case study from the book. So if you've been waiting forever to get your hands on this book, the case study, one of the case studies is out in this issue of Find Home Building. And the BS and Beer Show on July 3rd, we are going to have Chris Magwood and Jacob Rescuson to uh, talk about Builders for Climate Action Beam Calculator, a unique and urgently needed tool for assessing the upcom upfront carbon impact of homes before they're built. So links will be in the chat box if you want links to any of those things. So Ben, you're up to introduce our guests. I got a, a shipping notification for the Pretty Good House book. I don't know if it's accurate, but it says that I'm getting it on the 28th of this month. So that's exciting to know it's coming. Uh, I'm Ben Bogey, Bearded Weirdo, uh, Project Manager in Connecticut. Uh, this evening, I'm drinking a, a Sky Gazer Sour Crusher. Yeah, sour cherry ale of some sort. It's delicious, and it's a crusher. Uh, this evening, I have the pleasure to announce and uh, uh, welcome our guests, uh, all three phenomenal people in the industry, and we'll start with Josh Salinger. Josh is the CEO of Portland, Oregon-based Bird's Mouth Design Build, which operates out of a converted 1930s passenger rail car. He is also a regular contributor to Fine Home Building and Green Building Advisor, uh, and uh, my brother from another mother. Josh, how are you this evening, and what are you drinking? Doing great. Thanks, Ben. Um, well, it was my turn to catch COVID, and I'm on day, let's see, day nine right now. So I have my daughter's quilted um, beer <laughs> up here. I got to stand in front of this thing to make it work. There. <laughs> so it's delicious. This, this is just says how much I love beer so much that my daughter knitted me this thing um, for Christmas. Unfortunately, I'm not drinking tonight. So um, <laughs> sorry to hear that. You guys. Yeah, it's a bummer. So anyways, uh, yeah, uh, Josh Salinger uh, here in Portland, Oregon. Uh, Bird's Mouth Design Build is our firm. We do uh, custom residential uh, homes, uh, zero energy and passive house homes, and recently started taking on zero energy retrofits. Uh, you know, the mission of our company is to address climate change 
through the built environment. And we decided as a team that we can't be serious about that unless we also deal with the existing built environment, which is tough, but uh, we're taking it on. So that's, that's what our company does. And uh, thanks. Good on you. All right. Uh, my friend, Steve Demetric is owner of Demetric House Rights and a certified passive house builder based in Rhode Island. He built Rhode Island's first FIA certified passive house and is active member of the Northeast Sustainable Energy Association. Steven, how are you, buddy? Good, good. Thanks everyone for having me. Um, I realized, I was thinking about my job description and I, I realized the other day that like I, I, I used to be a carpenter and now I'm a carpenter trying to earn money. So that makes me a general contractor. <laughs> So that's, and um, now my dream job is carpenter again. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that for my future. Um, yeah, so we are, we are actually the only company in Rhode Island still that's 100% committed to building net zero houses and certified passive houses. And in our own special way, we're kind of pushing the envelope of uh, our assemblies and how to make things more environmentally friendly. Um, but as a company, one of the things like we're not, we we had one good idea with our slabless concrete floor, so we got that out of our system. So now we're just trying to basically push the envelope to try to make things be more normal for to make what we do more approachable for everybody. Like if what I did was in the shelf of Home Depot, that would make me really happy, even though I don't shop there. But that's the analogy I have. Oh, and I'm drinking um, Rhode Island's really good brewery proclamation. It's a double IPA for double the headache in the morning. Oh, it's really good. I'll have a good IPA helmet by 6 a.m. tomorrow. Excellent. It's Friday, though, so it's okay. Is it? It will be. It will. Oh, it will be. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Already is for me. Right. Yeah, it's Friday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're ahead of the international curve there. All right. And finally, last but definitely not least, uh, Lucas Johnson is a building scientist based in Tucson, Arizona, where he has spent two decades leading the charge towards building low carbon, high performance homes. He's also a certified passive house professional, a BPI building analyst and co-owner of Valley Homes, where you guys are doing some phenomenal work. Uh, Lucas, how are you this evening? Calling us in from Vienna. Uh, care to try and take a stab at pronouncing what that is that you're drinking? Well, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I speak a little bit of German, but not enough to be able to read the label. But uh, typically, it comes in a 0.2 liter size narrow glass. So I think it's some sort of lager, but it has a fruity flavor. So maybe it's a Rattler of some sort, but it's delicious. And I'm honored to join. Um, I think everyone here shares a common spirit of trying to solve major problems through their work in the built environment. Uh, carbon impact is one of the main things I care deeply about. Um, I got a Master of Environmental Science many years ago now and was going to continue into a PhD program, but got too concerned about the future of our planet. So I went and started building science divisions for various different companies, ran utility programs, and ended up uh, following my wife around because she's a professor now at U of A. Thus, we landed in Tucson, and I partnered with uh, my business partner and now co-owned Valley Homes, which is fantastic organization. We do building science consulting and then project development as well. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Lucas. Absolutely. So, uh, I guess we have some presentations from you fine gentlemen. Does somebody want to go first? Well, Steve, Lucas, do you guys have a presentation? I, I have some slides I put together. I'm a slides kind of guy. Oh, yeah, you were going to take the lead, weren't you? I'm, I'm, happy, to, I'm happy to kick this off. It's going to be a good, in. good uh, <laughs> It's going to be a good uh, teaser for the the beam stuff too, because this is going to be something that explains my journey towards why I care so much about concrete free foundations. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll kick it off. Let's see. I also took a brief dive into the science of beer to remind myself a little bit more about how the hop structures and all that other stuff works. It's very fascinating if you ever have some free time to look into that. Um, anyhow, so you guys are all professionals in this field. I'm going to skip a lot of the content I usually start with with this kind of presentation for the sake of efficiency this evening. But one of the key points that I try to make in the work that I do these days is that we have a lot of certified buildings and that's a wonderful thing, but we've been so focused on energy efficiency as the king of all things that we've often had 
perverse effects or accidental outcomes in that myopic focus on energy efficiency instead of a more holistic approach to building. So we have had, say, rotten mold failures. And as my buddy Chris Magwood shows here in his uh, three minute thesis he did, he actually made a elephant out of carbon dioxide molecules, which is one of my favorite things I've ever seen in a slide to talk about this fundamental issue of the carbon elephant in the room. Um, the way that we approach this at Valley Homes is we have what we call our five factors of good building. Those are comfort and health, efficiency and renewables, durability and resiliency, social equity and embodied injustice, as we call it, and life cycle carbon impact. When we do product specification for our clients or for our own projects, we take into account all five of these factors for every product that we specify. It has been a game-changing approach in these conversations. Um, you can go into a lot of detail, for instance, for me of why I don't like spray foam insulation, but if I can just tell someone it's an eight out of 50 point product on this scale, that makes that conversation a lot more efficient. So we'll talk about life cycle carbon impact because as I mentioned, that's the key driver for the work that I do. If you're not familiar with this concept, carbon life cycle of building, there's material carbon up front. There's the part of carbon that we can control very directly as builders, transportation, utilization. There's the operational use in buildings. And then there's the end of life cycle, which is why durability is so mission critical, right? The big kicker that a lot of people are catching up on all of a sudden, which is a really wonderful thing, is that the material embodied carbon, this is what Chris and um, Jacob will talk about in great detail in the future uh, episode of this, that typically represents 70 to 80% of the life cycle emissions of a building, right? Up front, the materials themselves create that much of the impact. So I'm gonna talk about our project that we're doing right now in Phoenix called Valley Muse. Muse is a concept of uh, housing where it's a type of, not community housing, but you know, um, missing middle style development where you have somewhere between four and 40 units on a property to try to create a concept of community as well as sustainability and all those good things. So why, why would we wanna to go towards concrete free? We ended up using quite a bit of concrete on this project. As you can see, here's a little snapshot of some of our foundations that we were doing. Concrete overall is a kick-ass material, right? It's great for a lot of things, but there's the carbon impact, mostly from cement manufacturing. There's the fact that sand is running out and harvesting is associated with some very gnarly business. It's expensive right now more than ever. And it's challenging to install well, especially in the heat of Phoenix, Arizona. So I had this moment running some beam analysis where I had to say, hey team, I think we made a huge mistake. We had stuck with a double stud wall design after converting to using exterior insulation and turning the two by six element of the stud wall into the insulated part. And we kept the two by four wall as a service cavity thinking, oh, well, whatever, you know, we don't want to do the structural engineering and all this other design stuff again. We're going to just stick with this double stud wall, even though we've moved to kind of a different, you know, performance layer approach on this building. The problem is that that ended up having us have 12 inch thick stem walls that then required massive footers and that stuck us into a pretty deep carbon trap. So getting into some of this information, footings versus slabs versus sub slab insulation. So the embodied carbon of our footings, this is a screenshot from Beam when it was still an Excel tool when I was beta testing it um, and ran some numbers on this we looked at the concrete we were using specifically and found out that we had about 28,000 kilograms in the footings and pads, right? The slab itself, even though it looks like it takes up a lot more area because it's spread out across the surface area, volumetrically is quite a bit less concrete. So that was about 8,000 kilograms. The major kicker we found out and why we decided to avoid sub slab insulation entirely two things. One is in Phoenix, being directly connected to shaded soil can help with thermal comfort in a building. But B, when you look at the embodied carbon of potential sub-slab insulation options, especially the most popular one in Phoenix being XBS foam board, it's, I can't see behind my thing, but I think it's something like, yeah, 63,000 kilograms, right? So almost double the entire concrete, and that's for uh, five-inch thickness. 
or sorry, no four inch thickness in the case of XPS. So concrete creates challenges, but foam must go. That was one of the con you know, conclusions that we had. This is the beam model showing what our buildings would have been. This is for four buildings total. Um, it would have been about 388,000 for 389,000 kilograms with um, concrete kind of being a drop in the bucket, right? So if we break this down and look at how this actually would have worked out, this is if we used XPS in our foundation walls. This is if we used closed cell spray foam and XPS in our exterior walls. And this is if we used closed cell spray foam and XPS on our roof system. Um, it would have been a massive combined carbon impact where the concrete was about 34,000, 33,000 kilograms and the foam insulation combined to be about 330,000 kilograms. So that made that very clear many other reasons we don't like to use foam insulation, but this really, really drove in that message. So instead, we uh, wrapped our building in wood fiber insulation and put the sheep wool insulation on the interior side of the building. There's my uh, older daughter learning how to do good building. Pretty excited to see that. She's seven and learning early. Um, and so we did this, what we call the uh, valley way and ended up with about 53,000 total pounds, which was a roughly 80% reduction, 84% reduction in our upfront carbon impact. Also doing things that were effectively cost neutral that improved the performance, comfort, health, all the other five factors. And from a social justice standpoint, our workers have enjoyed working with these materials instead of going home at the end of the day with horrible headaches from all the toxic chemicals. So concrete is now 63% of our total impact rather than being only about 10% of our total impact. So the irony is by getting rid of the foam, which got rid of most of our carbon impact, 84% of it roughly, we now end up with concrete as the leading piece of impact that we have in the building. Still 33,000-ish. So what's next for us? We're looking at smaller and shorter buildings, doing a Two-story double stud wall forces you to do some pretty massive concrete and steel details, which um, are unavoidably high carbon impact. And with smaller and shorter buildings in our desert climate, we've found a way to use ground screws. The soils there work quite well for it and do a completely concrete free uh, foundation system connected to an all wood building, which we hope can be net carbon storing up front. And the other project that we're looking into right now in Tucson is a rammed earth uh, with cord and steel roof and all that. Lots of glass here. Cord and steel is definitely high carbon impact. And rammed earth is good, a lot better than concrete, but it still does require using some cement. And cement, again, is one of the leading carbon issues in concrete. So it doesn't necessarily solve the problem, but we're really curious how these numbers work out. If they don't work out that well, I guess we'll do some rammed earth details, uh, maybe some benches or something and do straw bale walls because that's kind of the magic thing we found. Uh, too bad you can't use straw for foundations, but yeah, that's, uh, that's basically what I have to say um, as far as the presentation slides are concerned. It's uh, incredible how much embodied energy there is in the foundations. I don't want to say if we can um, solve that or address that, you can do anything you want with the building, but it sure feels like that someday, sometimes when you start running the numbers. So, yeah, I just think one thing about that chart that was interesting is it reminded me of uh, when we first started building Passive House and we started looking at the where all the energy in our homes were going. And then we realized that by eliminating all of these sources of energy, we got down to hot water being the biggest issue. And then everyone starts getting hyper-focused about hot water. And now you're trying to, you know, you're still trying to get another squeeze on a lemon. And it's like, at what point do you stop squeezing? You know, like, where's that? Like, I'd love to see that in those calculations to see like, at what point does it, at some point you still have a carbon Im impact. I remember joking with somebody at a conference years ago, like if you really want to do your carbon impact then you should just cancel yourself out of society in some fashion <laughs> yeah it's tough you know yeah. just walk into the ocean just keep walking and you'll be all set um that's not a popular uh approach though for no me. no I but that's, tell. That, that's the irony of it. like, <laughs> suicide's not the answer but um but it's like where that benchmark is that is that'd be interesting to find you know because at some point you need hot water in a building at some point you need this what concrete's doing 
that. It's, it's part of the, the perspective I've always, it's always rattled around in my brain. And hot water gets so interesting too, because then we move towards say heat pump water heaters and then the refrigerants become a major global warming potential issue, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they- yep. You can use CO2 for those. Yes, and you can, because heating yeah. only, wonderful, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'll, yeah, I, I've, we've used a couple of the uh, Sanco systems in uh, in Phoenix now, and we're definitely huge fans. If you can afford them, they're amazing. Yeah, um, yeah they're expensive. Yeah. Hey, Lucas, yeah. uh, one thing that you mentioned and I saw in the chat, too, that I was going to bring up was, you know, we always talk about the embodied carbon, which is really important. But with, um, you know, I'm going to share this real quick. This is from the UN uh, Environment Program. You can just, I put this in the chat, too. But sand right in concrete i mean they're just there's sand mafias there was that 99 percent invisible podcast yes. uh that really gets into that and all of the societal and environmental impacts that bump up against sand so i think it's worth you know incorporating in our conversations here not just the embodied carbon we're solving that by using less concrete with these things but we're also addressing this the sand issue right and if you just yeah. google this there's all sorts of stuff uh, that kind of gets into this, but sand is the second most used material besides water uh, on planet Earth. And so it's something to really consider when we're having these conversations too. Yeah. A, a large part of the, really the geopolitical posturing that's happening in the South China Sea right now is over sand dredging. So people <laughs> think it's a, a territory control. It's a territory control for sand because China recognizes the fact that it's a limited commodity. Yeah, I mean, we can't make any of, uh, you know, the microchips that run pretty much everything. We wouldn't have Zoom if it wasn't for sand. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think about. Um, and, you know, in our, our five factors methodology, embodied injustice is the one thing we value more than embodied carbon. And the level of embodied injustice that goes into sand harvesting, processing, et cetera, et cetera, is just yeah. wild beyond belief. It's take every action and horror movie you've seen combined and sand harvesting's worse. It's, so, it's gnarly. So with all with these, the, these kind of big picture items out here in the open, what are some of the ways that we can address this with different foundation types? Like what are some of the things that you guys are using or looking yeah, well, actually, at? One, or, thing I, one thing know. that's always driven me as a builder is I always question why. Like that's, I, I, it's, that's, that's how I start everything. It's like, why, why are we doing it this way? And one question why that pops in my head when we we're just talking about hot water is like the biggest driver of hot water usage after you get every or after you squeeze the lemon until there's nothing left is occupant usage um but the foundation when you think about it doesn't really have occupant usage but it does have the concept of somebody designing it somebody's engineering it and telling us what we have to use it was fascinating when we, we were talking the other night trying to prepare for this and um one of the brilliant ideas i had being in new england where everybody pours a 10 inch foundation on a 24 inch footing and then i just literally just three three weeks ago i'm trying to figure out how to value engineer squeeze some money out of a out of an estimate for a really low low budget high performance building and i was like why are we using so much concrete i went to the code book and i realized that we could actually pour a six inch wall and then josh showed me a slide from the pacific northwest where they're already using six inch walls and my local engineer actually told me, I was like, oh no, you can't go that small. It has to be at least eight. And this is a slab on great house. So there's like, there's soil on both sides of it. And my local engineer is forcing me to use at least eight inches. And yet we have no seismic issues. The only thing we have is wind for hurricanes. I mean, the weight of all the material in the house alone is gonna keep it from going anywhere. Yeah, so you I mentioned that and that was, that was crazy because around here, it's just like, you, it was weird to me to hear that. It was like, we just use six inch thick stem walls all the time. So yes, I really, I got to figure out how you guys got away with that. Cause I would love to just, if, like I, do, I was doing some calculations and if we were able to do a 12 inch footing with a six inch wall, we just cut our concrete by gosh, like 90% or not like more than half. And, yeah. It seems so wasteful. Yeah. We cut it by more than half, but then the other variable too, which is really important to me as a builder is that now we can, we can still do a normal foundation. Well, normal. I mean, the concrete guy is going to be laughing his way to the bank when he cashes his checks, but I won't care. But that that concept of allowing people to like, allow the concrete sub to do his business as usual, at least where we in New England is really important to allow people, like, basically you're tricking them into doing high performance. 
Like when I've always taught people about high performance, like the first slide I show is my excavator on site. And I point to him and I go, this guy does not know he's building a passive house and it doesn't matter. And then you show the foundation. It's like, this guy doesn't know he's building a passive house. It doesn't matter. And just if you can carry that logic through all of your subs, you'll have a very successful project. Well, but it's also, it's also dependent on where you live and how you build. Didn't you say that reducing from like 10 inches to about eight inches, just that small reduction got rid of something like 40% of the concrete? Yeah, that was like 30 or 40%. I mean, that, that allowed that's our footing to go down to, from because our standard footing is 24 inches by 10 to 12 inches thick, which is, that's massively overkill. Because even on bad clay soil, you only need 1500 PSI for your building, and, for a two-story wood frame building. I mean, I'm Michael and Emily, is that what you guys are seeing too? The thicker stem walls out there on the East Coast? We don't usually do more than eight, except for in rare occasions. I mean, we've, we've had, you know, unique site situations where obviously some things are different, but we typically don't do more than eight. Yeah, I, I grew I mean, up pouring eights on 16 by eight footings, and now it's changed to us pouring tens on 24 by 12 footings. And Maybe it's a Rhode Island really thing. Changed. <laughs> or or I, I, I try to avoid working with professional engineers. I do it more and more because I have to. But um, when I do my own engineering, I like to, uh, I, you know, uh, meet, meet code, but um, I'll often uh, uh, spec no footing at all if I don't need it like for uh, uh, for like a uh, uh, slab on grades I might do, do a tw tw 12 inch perimeter great great grade beam directly on crushed stone yeah. um, I did I did one 16 inch perimeter grade beam but uh, 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 that was uh, for, for for a a timber frame house so we needed the extra width for that but um and I'll, I'll occasionally do 10 inch um, it, if, if the wall's over eight feet tall, it's, um, I, it has to be a little bit thicker. I can't, can't remember all, all the ins and outs of it. I was all, always have to check the code, but yeah, engineers tend to be extremely conservative when it comes to, to foundations. I understand why, but it's kind of too bad that, um, that they can't be a little more creative. I do, do have sort of my creative engineers who are willing to do a few other things versus the sort of tried and true by the book. This is how we always do it. You bring up a really good point to do this pin pile foundation situation. Um, we had to find the most creative engineers maybe in the Southwest to even talk to us. It, we got about, I don't know, 10 no's before we got a yes. Uh, but once we got the yes, it was a very enthusiastic yes because they're like, we like to challenge in our, ourselves. We're like, wait, engineers want to challenge themselves? <laughs> it's incredible. We uh, tend to get engineers that have uh, a desire to add a, a two to three X protection factor to the already included two to three yeah. X protection factor. So you end up with, you know, 12 times the actual necessary items. Uh, but still here in the middle, we get 16 by eight footings and an eight inch wall. And uh -huh. I always wonder when we start gaming the numbers, uh, depending on how we game them, which everyone does, uh, particularly in calculations to uh, you know, everything from whole R, R value assembly in your wall, or uh, if you're trying to work your carbon number down or show that you're building something more robust. Uh, we always talk about the eight inch wall. It's a seven and a half. You can't get wall ties for eight inch. They're all seven and a half uh, in my market anyway. I can't get them. If you guys got them, you win. Uh, but it, if you actually were calculating the Nat's ass of your concrete, you would have to go ahead and deduct that half inch from your full height and your perimeter uh, of every bit of wall. And you'd want to go ahead and take out for windows, which no one does. So if you really want to give yourself all the credit you can, take out your half inch, deduct for your windows, and give yourself all the credit for the carbon that you saved, uh, if you want to boast that to your clients. And uh, I think everyone should really just be looking at trying to do the most good. And going from 10 to 8, that's a great step. If you can get from 8 to 6, that's a great step. Everything, just push it in the right direction. Well, to, to push this conversation about like wall size a little bit further, we, the project I'm doing right now, we just used an ICCF foundation. Some of you might've seen this on GBA and fine home building, but that's a six inch screen grid foundation. So what that means, it's a six by six column every 12 inches, 
with six mm. inches of airspace in between it. And then it's a six by six beam every 12 inches on center, rebar every 24 on center. So that's not only handling the foundation with less than a six inch wall, we just removed what, 30% of a six inch wall out of it. And it still meets all mm -hmm. the engineering requirements. You know, we pushed and the engineer had to do all the calcs, longhand calcs to work it out. But yeah, it works. So you can do you force the engineer to less. calculate it? Like you, you basically knew what the end what the end calculation needed to be, and you forced the engineer to go well, from the, to the manufacturer. The manufacturer had done all the calculations in order oh, to get the manufacturer did. sold. So, so we just had to have our engineer of record go through and assure that he was happy with the the numbers. Oh, they basically um, check their calculations. Exactly. I say we should exactly. find out who did the calculations for the code book. We should just hire him or her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. From solve. Yeah, they have like a monopoly like, on the country. Like permanent wood foundations. You can get away with permanent wood foundations. Like those are yeah, those exist. basic structures. Yeah. That's and are allowed by code. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, has yeah. anyone here used uh fiberglass rebar? Or if not, what's the limitation for that? Because that can take out a lot of the steel and the embodied carbon in these things too. I think it comes down to cost. And from what I saw, I saw some numbers recently, and I think it's actually in beam, the carbon reduction from steel rebar to fiberglass actually isn't what you would think it is. It's, it's exactly. a, it is a substantial reduction of like something like 30% or something like that. But when you look at the total volume of the, the rebar that's actually in the project, it's really not a grab. The big grabs are the cement reductions. And we're, at, we're making yeah. leaps and bounds in reducing the carbon impact of steel as well. There's a lot of recycled steel and renewably made steel now that there's even some steel that's being claimed to be zero carbon. I'm very skeptical of that. But, um, that yeah. would be raw. That would be cast iron if it was zero yeah, carbon, right? Exactly. Or is that bad? <laughs> cast iron. It's, it's, you know, it's some like, it's a Norwegian or Swedish company. So I believe it a little bit more, but I still, uh, I still am very skeptical of how that comes about to be, to be true. Um, that might be more math than science, uh, or, you know, creative math than actual science. One of the things I saw brought up in the chat um, was a pot potential for rammed earth in uh, foundation systems as well. And it really does have some interesting applications. Or, um, I'm blanking on their name right now because it's almost one in the morning for me. But um, there's a company in Phoenix, I'll have to send you guys the name later, that does uh, rammed earth and claims that you can do stem walls with their rammed earth product. Not footings, but stem walls can be done, which is really an interesting idea. Um, and then for this building that we're looking at for uh, doing in Tucson, that we're designing currently, um, we're heavily leaning towards doing a rammed earth floor system. So instead of doing slab, a poured slab, we're gonna do a rammed earth flooring system. The client may wanna do a concrete topper, you know, just like half inch, inch of concrete on top for that look, but we can get rid of the bulk of the actual concrete by doing this rammed earth um, approach to a floor system. The interesting thing is, as I was mentioning, cement is one of the main um, contributors to carbon impact. So you still do need cement to hold that together, but you do need a lot less cement. The other really critical thing is in this material carbon emissions that Beam talks about, it's not necessarily taking into account the transportation carbon to site. And if you're in the middle of the Sonoran Desert, you can take soil that you dug up to dig down and then use that soil again to create your floor system. So it goes from here to there and then there to there, and that's your transportation. So that's a really lovely opportunity as well um, to look into doing that type of approach. Um, just thought that's what was out there. Just having a conversation with an architect this afternoon that was investigating Bram Dearth Foundation stem walls for a project in Montana. Um, the, the issue became not that they couldn't get the walls to perform, it was uh, the cost of the labor to do it because it requires a level of skilled labor. And then as well as the cost of geotechnical certification of the soils used for it. So I, yeah. the material is there uh, and the ability for rammed earth to do these things is there. It's just whether or not we have anybody that can actually do it. <laughs> so really at, at the risk of hijacking this conversation to rammed earth, uh, <clears throat> we talked about this, uh, Steve and, and Lucas. Um, I was oh, just at the Best Most Northwest Conference, and uh, this guy, Michael Eliason, uh, with Larch Labs in Seattle, is a German guy, just came back from Europe with a bunch of um, new stuff, and they're, they're doing 3D printed rammed earth uh, panels, panelized walls, 
over there and I have some pictures of it. It's pretty cool, but it looks like a little C clamp robot that goes back and forth with a tube on it. And it just rams this earth into these prefabricated panels. So there goes the, there's the labor argument potentially, right? Where, where we just need more earth? robots. Yeah. yeah. Where are they getting the earth from to do that? Hopefully right on, nearby. I have no idea. <laughs> China. Yeah, yeah, China. China. The South China Sea. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll bring the Italian mafia back to life. Right. <laughs> but yeah, can we, or can we talk a little bit about uh, two other sort of um, um, high potential systems. One is ICCF, which I know B uh, B B Ben has done, and maybe people thought he was stuttering on the C, the, but th th thinking, think, thinking I was talking, but it was Ben. So I, I'm, I'm, I'd be interested in hearing more about ICCF. And then also helical peers. Um, is anybody using helical peers as foundation systems? Yeah, we actually, we did a project the other year where we had to use helical peers and it actually it got my got my brain thinking about trying to use them more but i basically came up it was it, the engineering was really the problem um because I, I think of like in new england we've worked on so many older houses that are it's basically it's a rubble stone foundation um like it was my ex man had a really funny story where he was this was probably 10 years ago and really big old mansion on the on the bay in rhode island narragansett bay and it's like him he was there with the architect and the and the builder and two engineers and they were trying to figure out how they were going to tie the foundation of this addition into this old building and my excavator basically said well tie it to what and they were like well to the foundation he's like there is no foundation like, what do you mean there's no foundation he literally went to the truck got a shovel went down two feet and there's no foundation <laughs> And that building's, you know, it's a McKim Mead and White or something analogous to that. And it's been there for 170 years or 150 years with no problems. And I'm thinking, like, why can't we do a grade beam foundation on a couple of screw piles with like a 12 by 12 little beam going around? And like, where's it going to go if you're on good soil? Yeah. And in this case, we ended up, we, were, we had to put in screw piles, but we still needed, it was a 24 by 16 inch footing all the way around. And then once, and that had to go into a regular wall, but then the engineer was like, oh, I'll just continue that all the way through. So now we ended up with this footing that was two and a half times the size of what we needed because of the engineer again. Wow. Like, there's not, I don't think there's anything in the code book about helical peers. And I think that might be part of the problem trying to make that work. Yeah, I think- Although there was, um, who was there's a fellow right now, David White did a project in New York, maybe six or eight years ago where he used helical piers in like a pole barn type construction. We did and one with Colbert when I was up there. It wasn't my project, but while I was working with Dan, we did a house on the shore, yeah. just adjacent to the shore, you know, small house, uh, it's completely on helicals. There wasn't really anything uh, that difficult uh, to it. We had a little bit of uh, um, metal strapping to resist some yeah. of the laterals on those, but that it was all pretty minimal. Uh, the one thing that I will say that was a little funny is, is that there was wind noise associated with the wind blowing underneath the house that none of us anticipated and that was a thing so if you ever oh, you just that, need some, you need some better out. air sealing details man. under the house <laughs> outside <laughs> the envelope yeah that's always uh, the issue it, 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 it's it's totally doable and that was like right yeah. adjacent to the coast so there's wind conditions and flood conditions and stuff there we didn't have a hard time also yeah. Maine's pretty easy to get things through so you guys have that going up there we yeah, didn't you guys only have a warming down coming. here in the southwest. Now I'm now I'm kind of worried about our floating foundation system for noise. I think I'm going to have to think about that detail a little bit more. Yeah, Thanks we're doing that. we're doing a helical pier foundation too, and I, that didn't occur to me either. So uh, you know, we're going to have to talk about that. The biggest problem that, that we have with the helical pier guy is you know we have so much ledge, so you really yeah. have to have the right site conditions. And you come out there and he even sees ledge, he's like, nope like bye this is you know this isn't this isn't gonna work for us so um there's, we made a good site great was, there's ways to handle that though because i've done a fair number of decks and additions on helicals and what you can do is you can go to a drop beam situation versus a flush beam situation yeah. which means that you can skew your beam a little bit if you have to steer yeah. around rocks yeah. so that's just a technique yeah, actually to, speaking of putting in your spend, pocket um, uh mike curtin has been doing a lot of deep diving into the the updating, updated deck codes that are coming our way and the size of the footings is going up dramatically and the accuracy of what's landing on them is going up dramatically 
and that we're actually starting to use helical piers for our decks now. So now we can just put in a helical pier with a little a little welded top plate, and we maybe form like a little cube on top with a bag of concrete, and then we're done. That's what we're seeing the application for helicals in our market. It's generally just for repair of existing foundations, and then for adding decks because yeah. of not not so much wind problems uh, and <laughs> acoustical challenges, uh, but really because people have a real aversion to things being able to get under their house. Uh, people that grew up with a crawl space full of snakes and stuff like that, uh, which is common around here. Ooh, uh, it's, a, it's a huge aversion to, I don't want anything to ever go under there. Plus we have, to, we have to get our water into the house. So we're gonna have to enclose that. So all of a sudden when you start trying to think of this durable thing that's gonna drop down and protect the under slab, or excuse me, the under floor from a freeze thaw condition from pest infiltration, you, you start to very rapidly complicate things to where you've, you've added so much complexity and cost to alleviate that concrete use, you just end up back to a concrete slab, uh, turned down slab condition or, or crawl space and basement. So that's, that's the challenge. That's why we have these conversations to try and push these things forward and find opportunities to, to improve conditions, but that's been the resistance to them here. And they're definitely not, uh, affordable in my market, which is incredibly frustrating because it is so much less work. You know, the guys in and out in a few yeah, hours with their truck, and you're like, "Why is this so much money? Is it the steel? No, it's the, the lack of demand." So he has to charge a lot because that's his third job this month. Yeah, it's oh, wow. so interesting you bring that up because one of the things we talked about in our little prep session was how climate dependent and regionally dependent all of this stuff is, right? Like. Um, the rammed earth floor system. The only reason I'm willing to explore that is because I'm partnered with this company, Natural Building Works. Good buddy of mine, Tucson, runs this, and they do a lot of rammed earth projects, walls, floors, whatever. They know what they're doing. Are they willing to do a stem wall? Not really. That's going to that's going to take some exploration. So we probably won't do that. But the floor system, almost certainly. Um, in regards to the insect proofing above the the floating. Um, foundation um you know obviously the sonoran desert the southwest in general has some pretty uh gnarly animals uh that you don't uh, necessarily want getting near your house including termites that's a major major problem but obviously scorpions snakes all that all that crazy stuff uh, but because of the termite risk we already do a metal skirt wrap around our buildings anyway to prevent anything from being able to get to the wood. So basically, if we do the floating thing, we can do a perforated metal skirt instead, which should be roughly cost neutral and work just fine, right? Um, the question then becomes, how do you really isolate that space from the desert environment below it? So thermally and apparently acoustically, that was the thing we hadn't thought about yet, mm -hmm. <laughs> how do we do that? Very, very interesting things. And I, I, it's, it's so fun to be with you guys and like kind of learning this new things yeah. to think about in real time. I really appreciate and that, that space. You just have to fill it with something. Yeah. Well, we, we, thought, we, thought, we thought about bicycles. it at one point in time when we had like a slab above grade kind of concept where you actually kind of like screwed in your piers and you threw down some rock wool and then you put your slab over the top of it. And so from a code perspective, it was treated like a slab, you didn't have to treat it like it was a, a crawl or something like that. And, but then the devil's in the details, to Travis's point, um, you know, then how do you get your air barrier completed? How do you, you know, uh, the, the construction timing of it and all that constructability aspects. I mean, you really get into the details and a couple of things here in the, in the quotes too, talking about pricing, it's definitely regional. In my region, those, those piers were so expensive. It was just like, uh-uh, like no way. And so I think if you're in a, and then to Emily's point about like the soils and stuff like that, you know, are you going to hit a giant rock, you know? So I think it really, if you can pull it off in your particular neck of the woods, then go for it. I, mean, I think this is the case with all of these things, right? Like whether it's a floating plywood slab or it's a CLT pier or whatever it is, find out what works for you in your particular thing and then yeah. just run with that, you know? Yeah, it's well, important too that the people doing the work uh, want to do it That's yes. the part, part of it too you know like you could you could have you, like like we could have my carpenters doing you know perfect block foundations but do they really want to be building foundations no they want to be framing 
So we, that's why we have foundation contractors. <laughs> so let's figure out a way to make it work for them. I'd written down as one of the things to talk about today is respect and love for the people who do the work, right? Because that's something that is oh, we're nobody without us, right? Yeah, <laughs> and it, it's it's insane to me because it's like they're the people who are doing the real work at this point, you know. And like if when you specify toxic materials, understand you're hurting people, right? Like that's not that's not a really good thing. And also double check your materials carefully because Josh, to your point. Um, you know, we're trying to do this as totally concrete free. And we're like, okay, we're just going to do it on the, the, the ground screws. We're going to have the, you know, LVLs floating around all good. How are we going to protect the bottom of that? Oh, we'll just put some hardy board up there. Oh, wait a second. That's fine. Yeah, who's going to crawl up there and do that? Gosh, darn it. That's not concrete free. What do we do? So now we're trying to figure out how to do something like treated plywood, but then the treated plywood's pretty toxic. So we're just like, ah, I don't know. Now we can we could do metal because we're going to do the metal wrap anyway. But metal's pretty high carbon. But we have a really good metal guy, so it's tempting. The, yeah, these challenges perfect. are why all of us do this work. Is it's you know if we wanted to build code built tracked houses, then we yeah. do that. But it, it's the challenge. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, something to throw out is is anybody here using Poslin ad mixes or portland reducing uh mixes for the foundations because those are easy grabs that the only person that needs to know about that is the person at the batch plant that you're ordering from concrete the problem we have is that nobody none of the local concrete plants are offering that because of, there's just, just no demand they should be though yeah. they should be able that's what oh, we've they been fighting recently is having to be able usually it's that they have the materials on hand they just don't know that they can do it which is yeah. the hoop no, that we're bet, jumping through just, right now you got a reminder in your iphone it, it took me it took me four years to get my local lumber yard to bring in 3m all weather flashing tape wow <laughs> yeah worth it. you know you could you could drive an hour over into connecticut and you know pick yeah, that right. stuff up at walmart basically yeah uh, so, uh, so, uh, Steve, have have you asked about asked about densifiers? Because because a lot of the Portland reducing admixtures also double as as densifiers. Uh, so they they're usually added in addition to the Portland, and but but you can can add them and, and reduce the the the, the uh, Portland. But but the problem is it has to be a tested mix, and and they'll they'll only only have a limited number of tested mixes. Yeah, there's basically there's just no demand in our area for anything like that. So, we, so we've been focusing on just trying to use less and less and less. You bring out, yeah, the, in Phoenix, it's the same thing. And we were trying to order lower carbon concrete in the middle of the pandemic to do this pour and uh, for this project. And, you know, the first question was, oh, do you guys have an EPD for this? They're like, what's an EPD? We're like, that's not oh. a great <laughs> um, OK. Yeah can we do this type of concrete? They're like, we make this concrete, you get it or you don't. Like that Yeah, was we our, make concrete. Yeah. We make concrete. Don't change the yeah. recipe to the Big Mac. Yeah, they're like, we can yeah. uh, change the slump a little bit, but uh, <laughs> just like. Yeah, we're, we're doing a project currently, um, and actually I kind of think Kylie's on the call here, but we're working with Scott, Scott Gibson and GBA to um, get this out to the world. But uh, we used a 50% slag uh, concrete mix uh, with this and the Oregon uh, DEQ is doing a case study on it. So there's a whole bunch of information on this. And what it, what we found out to be tough was it's finicky when you get 50% slag because it takes a lot longer to cure. Um, and it's also harder to place. So the, the folks in the field, hats off to them, like you were saying before, you know, they're resistant to it because when they're using it, it makes their jobs that much harder, right? And then the quality of the concrete that's coming off, like we actually left this thing in the forms for, I think, like seven, eight days or something like that. And when we pulled it off, it was just pulling off with the forms. It, did, it was not a high quality, you know, uh, concrete mix. We, we did all the testing and stuff, and it turned out that over time it meets the PSI when it was 4,000 plus or something like that. But the, the point being is like, this stuff's great, but it just requires your, you know, the people that are placing the concrete, the companies that are delivering the gravel. I mean, yeah. it matters what the pH is and the or the type of gravel or the type of the sand that these particular distributors are, are putting into it. And then you throw the slag into it, and it really gets complicated and more difficult. Temperature. Yeah, the, poor, poor, the poor form guy, he could have poured 
three more foundations in the amount of time it took while those yeah. were sitting there. Right. 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 They were not it. happy about this, really. They were they were grumbly. Yeah. And so the DQ interviewed all these people, and we'll publish that in GBA. So that'll be coming up. So there's some interesting stuff with that. So it's, you know, like everything, there's a there's a plus side and a, and a negative side, right? Yeah, that's exactly that's that example right there is exactly why I focus a hundred percent on trying to shift things within the framework of regular building. That's exactly why. Like like basically, I'm tricking people into doing really high performance low carbon homes. They don't even well, know it. And, and I, I think there's a the lot of angles to do that. Yeah, the, the chart that you know you showed earlier today, where it was just like the foam's got to go, right? And now your concrete number is so much higher. It's like you know, maybe what we need to do in some cases is just spend the time in figuring out what other things that we can compensate for, right? You know, the the how much can we put into the other natural building materials and other things that we aren't doing poorly yeah, exactly. to yep. make up for things that some, sometimes we just have to, you know, and and maybe it's a slow progression to change the industry towards other things, you know, and, and figure out like you did with the slag mix, like how do you, how do you make that better? How, how do you have people who can leave their forms behind for a week and or a week and a half? Like that's, it's already hard enough to get the concrete guy to show up at the site. I don't know, like. <laughs> <laughs> and that times three is what we created. Killer point. Like that, that's part of why we decided to start aiming for concrete free foundations. Cause if you can start reducing the demand for concrete, it's no longer the company saying, well, we have 12 people waiting behind you to do this. If you don't want to do it, we'll go with them. If it's all of a sudden there's a lot less demand for concrete, suddenly they'll be like, oh, hey, what can we do to get you to do concrete? To my point would be it's like like living building challenge does with your requirement to come up with EPDs for all the items in your project. Just ask because we're going through this process right now and it is taking work on our end to talk with the batch plants and talk with the mix designers to get them to find the EPDs and find the certified mixes. And really all it is is it's just it's phone calls and emails on our end. That's an easy lift. And Josh, I understand like there's some workability things to take into account there, but Maybe you don't have to go to 50% slag. Maybe we can go to ground glass or we can go to fly ash or something like that. But none of us will figure this out unless we ask and try it. Right. You know, to Stephen, to your point, it, you know, it's still the same forms. It's still the same technique. It's just a different thing yeah. coming out of the truck. So, you know, that's why. Yeah, for it's, myself it's as a small at, company, like I, I don't have the, like I, I do everything. Yeah, no, I know. It's, so, I like, have for me, architects like those, that, that I'm that asking simple lift to of do phone that. Calls like, is, yeah. That, that simple for me is just like, that would put me over the edge. So that's why I'm focusing on working with the people I work directly with. It's like, about, like I'm gonna have somebody about, laugh at me for pouring a six inch foundation this fall. To be well, fair, Ben, I mean, you, you, bring up a, you bring up a really good point in the, to give the concrete guys some credit, they did say what's an EPD, but then they said, huh, maybe I should look that up. So maybe it did start something. Oh, yeah. that's it. The, yeah. You're planting seeds at that point. The avenue that we're able to get down this or that's been proving to be successful is asking for certified mixes because that's something that the concrete plants have to deliver on municipal and commercial projects anyways. So they're familiar with how to get certified mixes. So if you just, those are like, yeah. it, for us at least have been the magic word, certified mix. And then they're like, oh, a certified mix. We found that that works for commercial and large multifamily, but you get residential, at least in our market, the residential folks are like, never heard of it, right? Yeah. And then if you go to the distribution plants that are doing the commercial stuff, yeah. we're small potatoes. They, they don't have anything to do with us, right? So it, it's challenging currently, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> what about things like carbon storing concrete? Anybody have any insight on using any of those things like carbon cure or any of these products? Seen it in your market happening? Anybody talking about it? I Just the BS of your show. Yeah, yeah. talk about here, it here tonight <laughs> we, we talked about it but i haven't seen it available and if it's available i don't know if it's affordable um i sure hope so um it would be let's put it this way i would love to keep using concrete but morally i don't feel okay using concrete anymore plus it's a huge headache to get it to happen so if it was easy and low carbon and affordable on it totally on board but given the carbon impact the social justice issues of forcing people to do this really brutal work 
and screwing up their business models if you ask them to stay there with their forms for two weeks or whatever, right? You know, it's, 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 I, I don't see a way to keep using concrete currently. That's good. Well, you know, it boils down to design, right? I mean, if we can design these things lighter and thinner and come up with ways to not have to use exterior insulation on the outside of these things, it makes such a huge difference, right? So, I mean, it boils down to that. And then to design something correctly, you have to keep in mind, these are what I was going to bring up with these five principles, right? Like with any foundation or any slab, there's five things that you have to be able to do. And so it has to have the first one being like, you have to have a solid not like native soils to put the thing on, right? So that's number one. Uh, number two is that you have to have a capillary break, right? We, that's our bulk water control so that we don't get water up into our houses. And that also doubles as our soil gas radon, you know, uh, layer, right? And so then number three is your insulation layer, right? You got to insulate these things, whether it's the slab edge or in certain climates, completely underneath the slab. Uh, then uh, you need a vapor barrier, a class one vapor barrier to stop that 100% relative humidity ground from migrating into the building, and then you need something to stand on. That's the slab, right? So as long as we can meet these five things, this is where we have to get creative, right? In design and, and through all this stuff and say, hey, how, and this is Steve, where you came up with this idea for the, the floating plywood slab. You're just sitting here going like, well, why are we putting this concrete? Yeah, why? So let's start with why. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, one of the big variables there, which is a really relevant thing in New England, is what do we need basements for? Yeah, like, I always tell customers like the basement's like the last. Did place you hear here. him, Travis? <laughs> I'm so ready for this. The basement this. is the place so ready. <laughs> where things go before they go in a dumpster. Like that's basically what the New England tradition is. Well, what are we using them for? Like, it's it's a lot of We're concrete. Using them to grow mold and make people to sick. Grow mold. <laughs> yes. Yes. Good. Good things. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We use yeah, them for inexpensive finished spaces in our market. They uh, they provide uh, half the square footage on the the fine home building house that I'm building. So there's three bedrooms. Is it a walkout? No, walk out. but it's a it's a well designed daylight. Um, it's it's still a, a little bit larger house than what we would normally consider a responsible footprint. But it's a mid century modern, so it's a single story above grade and a, a story below grade with uh, a cleverly daylighted. Uh, back of house condition so it doesn't seem like a basement yeah uh, the nine foot ceiling helps with that too but uh because Ooh, of the daylight more condition, concrete what's that that's a lot that's more concrete nine foot ceiling it is except at the back of the house where we're <laughs> above grade where we don't use any concrete and it's just a regular wood wall oh so it's so, a walk but they walk but they pour they pour eight inch walls out there steve so they're already less concrete than yeah that's right walls. seven and a half yeah, but seven and a half seven and a half yeah seven and a half yeah <laughs> walkouts make sense they're not basements technically but they are yeah this is very definitely a basement and uh, i am broadcasting from my basement which is finished it is uh it is part of the house and because it serves the dual purpose of anchoring this to the planet uh in my tornado ridden uh midwestern state i i vociferously defend uh the basements in our market as being useful and in many cases necessary, but a lot of times they're not. And in that case, we'll do yeah. uh, uh, slabless uh, crawl space. It's very common for us. Uh, we have a lot of creative details that we're trying to do what we can to reduce our concrete. So I'm not, I'm not saying, hey, everyone go pour a 10 foot uh, basement for no good reason so that you can grow mold. Obviously that's ridiculous. And if that's yeah. what you're doing in the Northeast, that's super ridiculous. But I will defend the basement for its useful life in our market. Someone in the chat brought up tornado zones for basements, which I think is a really good point. And in, in Phoenix, they can make some sense because below grade stays obviously a bit cooler than above grade. Yep. Uh, yep. Not as not as cool as you'd think because the soil up to six feet deep is going to be the three month average temperature roughly, right? So during summer <laughs> in Phoenix, that's some hot soil. Uh, so it, it can work out well, it cannot. In Seattle, basements terrified me. It was something you're gonna remodel every few years when you know the floods occur. Um, the floods, yeah. So I guess, again, it comes down to being highly climate dependent, right? Yeah, because honestly, in our market, basements are very inexpensive square footage. And the mm -hmm. way we detail them, it's actually the most comfortable room in the house. Uh -huh. Interesting. Interesting. What was that, Emily? Uh -huh. <laughs> 
yeah so this, I, I mean i have a walkout basement that is where my office is it makes sense uh on where we're at two of my four walls are concrete though i mean full walkout on two sides so when when we bought our house in seattle our primary criteria was no basement because they creep me out um, <laughs> <laughs> That's not a good environmental reason, Lucas. I'm just no, it's uh, really not. It, it, this one was a pure feeling thing. I, I didn't. There was also the building science I mentioned behind it, but it was mostly I just don't like them. But that's very, very hard to do to find a basementless house in Seattle. We we found a California, you know, cottage style house <laughs> built above a crawl space, which also probably is not the best scenario. Um, someone had asked about embodied carbon of uh, CMU walls versus poured concrete mm -hmm. walls. Um, I just did a quick run through beam and it looks like it's about a third of the carbon impact given you're not pouring concrete into the CMU, but if you're pouring concrete into the CMU, it's effectively the same. The same, yeah. Where we are, you have to fill them. Yeah, so. Yeah. I, uh, I asked that, that carbon cure question a little bit leadingly before because uh, I looked into it recently. We actually have two batch plants that are almost local to us but are currently catering to uh, tilt up panel manufacturers. So it's coming and Lucas, there's one in Liberty, Arizona, just adjacent to Phoenix. You have a carbon cure batch plant operational in Liberty. Uh, so it's worth, I, I had no idea. I thought this stuff was very much in the future. And just recently I looked and reached out to carbon cure and they, they are starting to pop up around the country. So oh, yeah. yeah, it's not yeah, going to get us a, a rid of concrete, but it's- Yeah, it's, 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 it's something like a 5% reduction in in CO2 emissions. So um, on one hand, it's a drop in the nothing. bucket, but uh, we mm -hmm. need every drop we can get. So it's, yeah. Yeah. If, if it's not astro astronomically more expensive, it makes sense. I mean, so if, if a lot of you are saying basements are good or important for the homeowner, even if they're not great for the planet, um, what about permanent wood foundations? Like why aren't like per, per pressure treated wood is relatively low carbon compared to concrete. What, why aren't we doing more permanent wood foundations? That's a great question. Uh, I think- yeah, We need Mike Curtin for that one. Mike's yeah. been doing them for a long, long time. Yeah, when Mike and Jake were on the show, they really did a great job of uh, making a solid case for them. Uh, you yeah, know, Jake grew up in a house with a wood foundation, yeah. right? The only one that didn't leak that yeah. he lived in from, uh, from his recollection, which is kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, but we do have a significant uh, then gravel transportation like this is this is for me what scares the hell out of me about trying to get into the numbers is you really have to keep chasing every single change and so now you've added the plastic you've added a lot of plastic you've added more drainage conditions you've added additional grading to make that drainage work well more trenching than grading uh you've added four times the exterior gravel is what i would typically use to protect a drain tile system you have transported that gravel depending on your proximity to uh, where it's coming from. And so then it becomes very rapidly a challenge to do the right thing again. And we have to face those challenges, no question, but that's how people don't end up doing wood foundations. Totally. And uh, whether that is true, the Northwest will say water and the Southwest will say termites. Yep. So it comes down to that. To where, where you live is going to determine how you should build that. Sorry, Steve. You, oh, you go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned a um, vapor barrier that was also a termite barrier. Yeah. Which I hadn't heard of before. What was that? Yeah. Who had this? Who had the Stego? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So Stego has a new product called Pango, P A N G O, um, that we're using on all of our projects at this point that used concrete. Um, as a sub slab vapor barrier, but it's also a termite barrier. So we've done some really creative detailing to make sure that that wraps either, you know, around and over the concrete or under, depending on if it's monopore, or, you know, classic uh, foundation approach. And it's, it's, it's a great product. It's heavy and it's slippery and it's a very big roll. So it's one of those things that you're just like, once it's on site, you're like, oh my God, this sucks. But <laughs> once it gets and it's very stiff so like getting it laid out into trenches it it, it, it is a hassle I'm not gonna lie but it, it's very cool once it's done um the detailing of penetrations gets a little complicated we did like uh, the Compigo tape from Proclima with Viscon liquid applied on top of it to make sure those things stay sealed uh once you put the weight of the concrete on top of it when you're pouring it 
with the slab because we had we had one situation where the pango was going over stem walls poured but then pouring concrete for the um for the slab on top of it and obviously there's a lot of stretching pressure that happens at that point so we were very very concerned about our plumbing and whatever penetration is coming through it so it required a ton of detailing but very cool product um versus the alternative for termite proof proofing which is not a thing um <laughs> We use proof way too much in this industry, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but uh, basically it's spraying incredibly toxic chemicals up front and then every five years moving forward. Um, so having something that's a non-toxic barrier that goes down, takes care of your vapor barrier and your termites. Yeah, we're a fan. That That's despite the hassle of installing it, it's worth it. Um, there aren't embodied carbon numbers on it to my knowledge but it was one of those ones where toxicity trumped the other considerations like environmental toxicity of uh, the termite sprays are really, really bad. Well, and I think that's something that's important to say like, yeah, it was clearly a pain to, to do it, but it's something that we're, we're not talking about, which is what's the long-term thing that you have to do. And like this five years every year with this, you know, like, it feels like in the home building industry, we don't always, we, we hadn't been talking about embodied carbon emissions and the stuff that showed up every day. Like that wasn't a topic that we talked about a lot until we were like, oh crap, we need to talk about this. But we also don't talk about the long-term maintenance. Like there's no such thing as maintenance oh, yeah. free. Like you got to do that every five years. And what's the cost of doing that both environmentally for the person who's spraying it and for you cost-wise, right? So we we've kind of gotten into this home building, like everything's got to be quick and we got to do it as quick as possible. And we got to get in and we got to get out. But sometimes some of these things are just important to do and it takes longer and we have to change the market or give ourselves grace to do the things that are important now, you know, for the long-term durability of our structures. Yeah. yeah I mean, high performance building up uh, Oh, I'm sorry, just going to say real quick, with the occupancy being an HOA, we didn't want that to stand for heck of an argument, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, good luck getting the HOA to do that every five years, you know, right. And like, what are we going to do? Just like, I guess a lot of times the answer is just leave and not care after you sell it. But that's not how we think at all. We're like, we're no. responsible for these yeah. buildings for 100 plus years, even if we're not alive, our kids are going to help take care of these things, you know, right. Yeah, I was gonna say that long-term durability is actually the, probably the biggest factor in sustainability. And even the like we spent the majority of the time talking about carbon footprint of concrete it's, uh, on the larger scale of the homes being built in this country. This con that conversation is actually irrelevant. It's like how do we detail what we're doing already to make it work is way more relevant if we want to actually have an impact. And there's just like the same concept of like. Like Josh, like the concrete plants near you that are doing this stuff are servicing commercial jobs, really don't care about you as a small residential contractor. That's mm -hmm. the same, same, that's that same, and it's the same analogy. Exactly. So, how do you make a difference? It's like, well, build these things to last. Like, and if you are going to do a foundation and you're going to finish it, like, actually, I'd be curious, like, how people, how do people detail that? Like, I, I would love, I would actually, I'd love someone to give me a really good reason to put insulation on the outside of my foundation it's it's an interest i mean you bring up the there's a lot, a lot of people there's that details all over the place and i still can't yeah i can't figure that one out to, to get rid of the insulation on the outside or have insulation on the outside like why is it on the outside we put ours on the inside I was like, te outside. technically, if you take the passive house course, I do believe that there's some slight minor thermal better performance, right? But if you think about the long-term durability and what you have well, to after cover the bugs it are with my dad. How, how you have to <laughs> handle it, I don't think that the long-term durability matches the small energy performance savings that you would have by putting it on the outside. We pretty much never put it on the outside. It just causes so many issues. We, like, uh, why would you want something you can't see that you might have to dig up or deal with or you well, like if you think about it one of the important things about the thermal and vapor envelope is that it needs to be protected forever so why would you want to leave it to the elements 
Well, well, Steve, you do you do like I see contractors around me do is they put the the foundation insulation up to grade and then they just stop at grade so that you don't have to worry oh, yeah, about that, detailing that. that part of upgrade. That <laughs> yeah. one solution works really well. Insulation, thirty yeah, percent. Yeah, for the most of, of available <laughs> part of the foundation. Yeah, it's like yeah. What's the worst performing part of your house? The one foot between grade and yeah. where the wood wall starts. Right. So we actually came up with a solution for that kind of clever because you know passive house was brought up and one of the things that Fias anyways talks about is like they place durability in front of energy efficiency because they're like well if we don't have a building that lasts what are yeah, we what's doing? the point yeah yeah so um you know we do this little trick where we just take at the interior side of the mud sill we just have like a five eighths inch or however thick your drywall is piece of foam uh, that we just put on the inside prior to putting on our baseboard. So we'll install the uh, sheetrock up about three inches, uh, just like a temporary block or something like that, pull that, replace it with this little piece of uh, foam right there. And that's enough to break that thermal bridge right there so that you're not getting those durability issues. It makes very little difference on the energy performance, um, but it makes a big difference when you run a therm model on it in terms of durability. And that's just a, such a quick, easy thing to do. That It's like, why doesn't someone make a baseboard with foam on the back of it? And you could just well, bang the that siding has foam on the back of it. it your foam baseboard, yeah, yeah. All right. And that's a that's a use of foam even I can get behind. So that's, that's something. Uh, yeah, impressive. You know, yeah, could uh, have pulled a rabbit out of a hat, Steve. That's where you would, offset would, it would everywhere else. Stuff? Where this in one instance it makes sense. And it's and that's and that's like that's all you know. It's so funny how we get so um, just cure about what our statements are instead of just being like it's all case dependent it all is every building's unique every building in its sense is an experiment right like you need to model for that building specifically um, for instance our foundation detail we did put foam on the outside we used eps recycled eps foam on the outside so it was the least bad foam we could find covered by that pango covered by the metal skirt that we put over it um, but the reason we do that is because most of the high performance modeling done is about preventing heat from getting out of the building into the cold environment. We're in a very different scenario in the desert where we're very much trying to prevent heat literally from the soil getting into the concrete up into the building. So it's about breaking the, the, the thermal contact of the concrete to the soil so we don't have conductive heat transfer. Um, that's why we did that on the outside, but it was it was a weird decision too. We were kind of like, mm. yeah. So we do the same thing, but from the inside. Yeah, and we're worried about heat from well, basically cold, but basically an interchange of heat and cold in the in the foundation. Where in the summertime in New England we get wet foundations. Um, that's why you throw everything away that you put in the basement. Um, <laughs> but if you insulate the inside, then you don't have that problem. Yeah. Yeah, we only get wet during monsoon season, and that is a gnarly time. If uh, one thing that's commonly not understood about the Southwest is that it has major rot and mold issues, maybe even more so than the Northwest, because we get this, A, everyone's like, oh, it's dry in the desert. Who cares about waterproofing details? And then B, is we get this month or two of monsoons where it's hot and wet at the same time, and that accelerates damage insanely quick. Uh, we had to return a couple stacks of plywood because it rained on them a week later, full mold. Like I've never. I mean, does that turn into groundwater water. coming into the foundations? Uh, sorry, what's that? Does that turn into groundwater coming into the foundations? You, usually, the soils are so rocky and hard that there's very little drainage. It turns into bulk flow that just kind of becomes stormwater issues more than drainage issues. But we do sometimes, depending on the soil, do some drainage details around. But most of the time, you yeah. bring up drainage in the desert, and people are like, it just flows that way. <laughs> it goes to my neighbor's basement. It goes into my. <laughs> exactly. It's like, that sounds so New England. It just goes that way. Yeah, it's, it's, it's on the neighbor's property. It's somebody Maybe, else's yeah. problem. What are those ways? Yeah. It, not not in my house. So whatever. It's kind of how it is. It, it's 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 pretty wild. For for those of you insisting on using basements, um, is anybody do, doing su, 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 superior wall or other other precast systems that are high high psi and waterproof but reduced amounts of concrete? on a stone footing, something like that? 
we, we actually, we looked into them on one job and the, I had two issues. I had one was it was more expensive. And second of all is I, the, the one that they had I, at the time, this was probably four years ago, I couldn't create that thermal break at the footing. Hmm. Like the way, because they have this, the way their steel studs go, go like our, our, our model is to do continuous insulation like uh, above the footing, like we do, we do a traditional footing, crushed stone level with the footing. We put our EPS down and then we carry it up the inside of the, the foundation walls. And then we just insulate from the top of that to the, to the bottom of the uh, subfloor. So we're basically creating this fully conditioned basement. I couldn't do that with the superior wall. Um, and also because of the steel studs, like the way they, the one we were looking at had steel studs on the inside. And you can't really insulate inside the seal the steel stud. We use the same so, general methodology as you, Steve, just with Rockwell instead of EPS. And we looked at Superior on two occasions, and both times we had a the same cost concern. Uh, but the access is shockingly frustrating. It's one of the things that you don't really think about when you start talking about, oh, you know, we're gonna be more efficient, we're gonna have panelized, we're gonna, we're gonna bring out big things. Even floor trusses are a nightmare for me just getting them to the site because so much of what we do is infill. So, uh, you know, many of the lots in this area, probably not unlike the Northeast, are more narrow. And uh, some of the roads basically don't allow for a tractor trailer, which is how they want to deliver those superior wall sections. So oh, we were yeah. gonna have to get them delivered to our lumber yard, have them offloaded, and then brought on the lumber yard's truck uh, with the donkey to unload a panel at a time and then we could get a small crane company to bring their little truck mounted <laughs> crane to set them, or we could pay our steel company. Uh, I want to say it was like $1,400 a day. So every time we got a truck, we'd have to have the steel company come out and then they could go ahead and swing those in for us because we just don't have this massive, uh, Emily and I have talked about this before. In an ideal situation, we would go ahead and do a development. And the first thing we would do is build the tower crane in the middle of the cul-de-sac. And the tower crane would be able to build all the houses with the panelized systems that could be super efficient. And it could even reach out to the, the nearest major road and offload the giant truck there so that we didn't have to pave an entire ocean uh, to make these trucks turn around. Um, so this is, again, when you start chasing the numbers, man, actually what it is, is not the numbers. When you start looking for the villain to fight in your build, you find out that everyone's a villain. And you, you have no hope of winning. It, 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 it travels travels a little about, bit, like, just a little bit mean. It's, it's also, it's not all always about cost. It's the fact that when you're building a house, like the permutation on the number, the amount of shit that goes through your brain, you're like, the last thing I need is to add 12 layers to getting a foundation. You know, there, there's when a it, value to that as well that you have to yeah. consider. And that's why when you start looking at all these new, new products and new concepts and new things, it's like you have, there's a lot to consider. And there's so many, there's a permutation there of like, like, is it local? Is it, are the people going to want to do it? We have the skill level. And then you've got the risk of like, well, how's a rammed earth and the earth foundation going to perform in Seattle? And it's like, well, I don't know. It's like, there's just so many, and that's why it comes back to understand the why. Like if you understand the building science, if you understand the variables that go into every decision that you make, that's way more important than what you're doing, why you're doing is really important to understand. Totally. Governs all. One of, here, here. One of the pushbacks that I've heard on the superior walls is, is uh, just the fact that they're a, a defined dimension. So when you're going through like SD with an architect or something like that, there's a lot of pushback between what superior walls can provide and what the architectural goals of the client and the architect may be. Uh, the, the company that I work for has done a number of superior walls projects in the past and they ended up abandoning them or stepping away from them because of that, because it was just too much back and forth. Superior walls couldn't provide the sizes they needed. Sure, if you're going to do a standard rectangle with a fixed increment of two feet or whatever it is, that's fine. But when you start getting into custom yeah. homes, they don't always work. Great concept, yeah. though, if it fits. But that's actually true for um, regular board foundations, too. It's one of the things I had in my notes when I was thinking about this was uh, like how to make the how to make it concrete more efficient and make it work better for the people that are building it. And one of the variables I had is like, don't design walls in half inch increments. Um, so we did, we've had a house that was like 20, 20 feet, three inches. And I was like, wow, it would have been a lot cheaper to build this house at 22 feet wide. 
Nineteen two hundred and fifty-six isn't isn't a thing. You can't build to that. I don't understand. <laughs> Come on now. That was always my dad's thing growing up. He's like design houses in two foot or four foot increments because then your offcut works to start your next row. You know. And yeah, actually, the last the that. last house we finished, I put on my Instagram post. I actually designed it, and every single person that worked on that house, absolutely, all the tradespeople, absolutely loved the house. And we realized the common denominator was it was designed by a builder. So like when they sheathed the second floor, there was not an ounce of weight because it was 36 <laughs> feet wide. Um, like that it actually that calculated fig, it. Figure your gable the architects the, on the offcuts call. to the next end. Yeah. Yeah. Designed like we by it, we a good that. builder, maybe. Yeah, we framed designed the by a good the... builder. There are good builders. There are good architects. Yeah. There are bad architects. There are bad builders. Oh, yeah. Like we all have to admit that. Because uh, oh, I... I made my husband look at 52 houses before I found one that I could live in, which if you follow me on Instagram, you know, I've been blowing up for the last year and a half. So, you know, that's like a totally different story, but we <laughs> went through this house that was designed by a builder. And I kid you not, I do not have lavish furniture. The only thing I could fit in that house was my dining room table, not a wall. I could put a bed on, not any room that I could put my couch in like beautiful materials, probably laid out really easily not functional to actually live in so I, I agree with that we could be better as designers and design the things that would make things way easier to build um if you talk to ted benson um he's got this whole system because they build a lot oh, of yeah. panelization and they and they yep. learn a lot about that and and there's a lot Tectonics. true to that and that thank um you know unfortunately the world has gotten into like the fussier we make it the more beautiful it is architecturally which is silly um and so i definitely agree with that but um there's a, we a be question in designers. There. there's a question <laughs> in here directed towards lucas but to everybody is anybody using uh like foam glass aggregates insulations below slab and uh, more interestingly, I'd like to know if anybody's seen any of the expanded glass bead being specified on anything. That's one that just came across my desk a couple of weeks ago as an ad mix to concrete. So expanded glass, anybody using it? Yeah, I did. Uh, you know, I used to be the Western Regional Manager at 475. So I was involved when we brought Glavel over and started using that. I did a couple of pilot programs, uh, pro pilot projects rather. Uh, with Glavel, it was it was a good product. Um, the you know it's insulation. It does some drainage, which is nice. Um, getting it was pretty difficult. It was relatively expensive. The carbon impact is pretty much the same as EPS, so there wasn't a huge argument to be made there. The one thing we really did enjoy using it for, though, was uh, backfill around foundations because it gave you insulation around the perimeter and drainage. So it's insulation around your perimeter that stays dry, which is and, pretty and reduces soil pressures on the foundation. As uh, well. That's an exactly. excellent idea. Exactly. So we were really stoked on Glavel for that specific purpose. Um, and then I moved to Arizona where putting insulation below your slab usually doesn't make sense if you're insulating around the perimeter. So I kind of lost uh, lost the interest in, in doing that. But um, if we could get our hands on some gravel, we would absolutely be putting it around our perimeter walls in Arizona. Yeah, for, for the work we're doing, like we, we haven't been able to get gravel into our price points. And I'm, I'm not doing high-end crazy houses like our our houses for, for where we are are like 250 a square foot to 300 a square foot, which is really low in New England. And so we're engineering out a lot of that, that wildness. Um, but we do have a design coming up that I'm mentally kicking around of, which is actually screw piles, the smallest grape beam possible, infilling with gravel and then just doing a slabless slab on top of that. Hmm. And it's a smaller house, it's like 1200 square feet, but I don't have any details to share, but um, but that's that's one of that we are looking in that direction. Yeah, I've got a lot of uh, feedback when I present on the slabless slab about people asking about foam glass in lieu of the rigid foam board. And absolutely, I mean, no reason not to. I think yeah. the, the biggest thing is, can you get it, and can you afford it? And, and if you can, then then great. Yeah. So in New England, we can get it. Like it's it's coming out of Vermont, and then actually in Rhode Island, their slabble is actually opening up. A facility in Quonset, which is 20 minutes from my there's house. There's also 
people uh, seem to always miss, there's another company in the U.S. called Aero oh, yeah. Aggregates, which is all yep. over the U.S. because it's used hugely in uh, what's the like geoengineering projects for roadways and stuff like that. And yep. we just don't realize it. It's uh, to me, I, the numbers I saw, Lucas, is that it is actually a good bit better than EPS to, to some degree. It's about a 30 percent grab, which is. Depends on the EPS, but yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it depends on if you're talking which uh, foam glass you're talking about. But we've also been able to uh, get it come close to cost parity for us because we're able to reduce the fact that we have uh, clean wash stone below our slabs because we can mm -hmm. use it to serve that purpose, and also it installs really quickly. So we're not quite yeah. at cost parity, but it's close enough that. That, that's actually take somebody my, my, really, really uh, with a sharp pencil to catch you that it's not close enough to. Yeah, invest. that's actually my, my instinct then is going in that direction. And that's why mm -hmm. we're really looking for it. Because we're using, you know, 10 inches of crushed stone onto our slab. Yeah. Well, you put 10 inches, there's, there's, there's our 17 in foam glass. And it's, yeah. you know, you take the cost of well, the Well, we got to get it above the then, footing too. But yeah, uh, well, there's but if we make the footing seen. really small, we don't need it. It's pretty it fun to install overall compared to like trying to lay it is. flat, you know, you dump it in you, and you don't even have to have like that flat of soils, right? You don't have to get it perfectly flat. Our well, excavators it's love it. It's lightweight. Yeah. It's easy for them to push around with rakes and stuff like that. Well, that's true. But if you're going to pour a slab over it, it doesn't matter. But if yeah. you're going to do the plywood, a plywood subfloor over it, then yeah, trying to figure out how to make that flat enough will be interesting. Yeah. so so oh, what we're doing we're doing we're doing exactly that steven so what we did is we did uh not to get like get lost on my projects here but we uh used their standard inch and a half minus material to oh so you told me that yeah yeah and they, and made, then they, they have a, a they have a size. smaller aggregate size they have a one inch minus aggregate and then we just topped it with a half inch of sand on top of that to yeah. smooth it out and we realistically probably could have omitted using the sand but we we're just we already had it because we thought we we're going to need it Totally. And what I was saying is that the structural soil below it doesn't have to be that smooth. Like yeah. if you're trying to lay foam down flat on it, you know, boards are going to crack and stuff. If it's not smooth, it can be pretty bumpy and nasty. Bingo. Yeah. And Bingo. when you lay it on top, it flattens out real nice. Um, I only, we the only times I did it was with a slab, you know, concrete slab poured on top of it, but I like the idea of putting plywood on top. We're, we're trying that in Lemington. I, I know my contractor reaches out to Ben every time he has questions, so. <laughs> Well, you know how it goes. <laughs> Has anyone seen any of these these pour over or like foam glass beads? This was something that was just new to me. Never it just popped up one. on an architect's spec. It's it's like if you took like EPS beads and it was made out of glass. And apparently we can get batch plants to add it to concrete. Whoa. So, you, so it reduces the concrete and uh, also makes the concrete to some degree insulating. Sounds like a future show topic then. Yeah, Does it come I in rainbow it's, it's, colors, like I Cornish? wish, because yeah. that would be awesome. <laughs> you can get do like a terrazzo too. wall or something like that. Yeah, yeah. now Over we're taken. <laughs> so I am afraid that we are running up on the end of our time together, and I want to make sure okay. that everyone has an opportunity to sort of give some parting thoughts if they would like. Uh, obviously, my parting thoughts are to thank all of you for joining us, especially Lucas, who is, I believe, uh, at one thirty in the morning Vienna time. And uh, wow, that's commitment. So why don't you start us off, Lucas, uh, parting words for, uh, for the show comments tonight? Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's such an honor to join and, you know, connect with all you guys. And um, it's, I guess I'll end on the durability note. I just want to emphasize, I agree with durability being the biggest thing in sustainability. Um, you know, I'm talking to you from a probably 120 year old building that's made out of stone walls. It's quite comfortable in here, you know, new windows. So there's that. Um, and one of the most insane things that people do is tear down old buildings to build new high performance buildings because the embodied, the embodied carbon numbers are almost never going to work out for doing that kind of thing. Um, just do the carbon math, I guess, is my big request, right? Like, um, our house in Tucson, it's at the lowest performance house you can imagine, single pane windows, there's a sarcastic amount of insulation in the attic, there's no insulation in the walls, it's, it's just silly, but it's covered in solar panels, and it's net zero, including charging our car, so, and it's comfortable, it's pretty darn healthy, it's what I would call truly good low performance, that is an option as well, when, when we look at carbon oh, yeah. as the criteria. Um, so yeah, do the carbon math. That's my request and tune into the next one, uh, or maybe one after this with Chris and, uh, and Jacob. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, a nice plug the way you slid that in. We appreciate that. We'll get your uh, check in the mail uh, on Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> how about you, you Steve? Then. Steve Demetric, what would be your, uh, oh. your, your parting thoughts? Um, I'm disappointed I didn't get to do my slideshow that I didn't make. Um, <laughs> oh, well, when would you and, like to come da- back and do that? Because um, oh, we just put it on the calendar. <laughs> yeah, sign me up. Um, no, I'd say um, I'm really I'm really appreciative of like I I haven't been in this community for a while. Like I used to try to be really active and writing for JLC and stuff, and um, and I've been kind of in a cave for the last three or four years, and uh, so I'm thankful that I'm given the opportunity to share the uh, share the knowledge that I have and all the crazy stuff I think about. And um, I'm really appreciative of the fact that there's so many people out there that are really starting to think about this stuff and it's gaining momentum. Uh, one of the things I, I mentioned the other night, like I had this idea in my head the other day that I, I was thinking about code build houses and how they're basically still just caves with doors and windows and some thermal control and an a la carte menu of amenities. And we still have a long way to go to improve on that. And um, I'm so glad that people here are still interested in doing that. Well said. How about you, Josh? Well, uh, you know, we, we touched on this a couple times, but, you know, I often get asked, you know, like, hey, can you just design a wall for me that we could just use that's like above code um, and we could just run with it? You know, an architect will come with to me with that or a builder or something like that. But, you know, you really got to find your local solutions, right? I mean, you got to figure out what works in your market and you have to understand the principles behind it, right? And you just have to apply those principles to what you have locally to do the best you can. And don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? Just yeah. you do the best you can with the knowledge you have, continue learning, follow those principles and, and deal with your local, whether it's trade knowledge or materials availability, pricing, whatever, and just keep you know, pushing. It's like that constant pressure constantly applied, right? And I think that we're not going to find any national solutions or anything like that. It's going to be regional um, and, and look for those things. Yeah. Learn, learn the why. That's mm-hmm. perfect. I can't think of a better parting comment for uh, on behalf of the Brew Crew. I want to thank all of our uh, attendees and viewers. And uh, again, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us tonight. Cheers. And uh, until yeah. next month. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, all. Thanks,